Welcome to the Tech Academy's workshop. I'm super excited about this. This is me, Eric Gross. I am your uh, host for tonight. I'm a senior level software developer, a uh, veteran. I was in the Navy for uh, six years and a couple of months, operated nuclear reactors. I was an electronics technician and uh, I taught computers and nuclear power and electronics and a bunch of nerdy stuff in the service, which is pretty cool. That's one of the places I learned that if you really want to know something down to its core, volunteer to teach it. Of course, I didn't volunteer because that's not how the Navy works. <laughs> First day on the job, they said, Eric, you're going to be a classroom instructor. <laughs> like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm 19 and I'm an idiot. <laughs> are you sure you really, are you really sure you want to do that? But I uh, turned out that one, I loved it. And two, yeah, if you want to teach something, you better know it really well. You know, find out really quickly what you need to bone up on. Um, I'm also the co-founder of the Tech Academy. That is the group that puts these free classes on, and I'm really glad to be here. We have an assistant in the class. Regina's there watching the chat. She said hi to everybody. Uh, she monitors the chat, answers questions, and in general just takes care of things so I can just focus on the business of delivering as much value to you folks as I can during these classes. Um, please be nice. If you're not, Regina will remove you. I almost feel like we don't need to say that anymore because we have such wonderful people attend these classes. But I know the first time I don't say it, some Yahoo will think that's his or her excuse to <laughs> be obnoxious to me. But in general, these classes go really, really, really well. All right, so yeah, use the chat as much as you want. Um, you can ask questions in there. If Regina's uh, able to answer them right away, she will. Otherwise, we do usually have a Q&A at the end, uh, time permitting. And no matter what, if there's any outstanding questions you really want answered, you can all, we'll give you an email address at the end. You can always send them to me and I will get you an answer. So here's the agenda. We'll have a short explanation of the Tech Academy, who we are. We'll jump into the workshop, a topic I'm super excited about. You know, our book, our boot camp's even worth it. And I'm actually not biased. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a moment. <laughs> even though I'm a co-founder of a boot camp, um, I've experienced it all. At the end, we'll have a brief Q&A session. We'll go over some information about our boot camps, and we'll have a free gift for you at the end of the class. So please stick around to the all the way to the end. Whole class should take about an hour, hour and a half tops. So, the Tech Academy. Who are we? What do we do? Well, we deliver boot camps, coding boot camps actually. And at this point, most people who are interested in tech have heard of boot camps. I got to tell you, when we started over a decade ago, very few people had. They were brand new. Uh, when I first sat down and designed what became the Tech Academy, boot camps had been around for about six months. And what they are is intensive technology certification programs. So they're designed to prepare people for entry-level positions in tech. Depending on the boot camp you go to, they typically last three to six months. And they focus on practical, modern skills. Now, we've been offering thorough, budget-friendly, flexible, and trusted coding boot camps, as I said, for over a decade. Our programs are cost-effective. They're self-paced, which is pretty cool, actually online coding boot camps. They're tailored for beginners, people that have no prior technical or coding knowledge. <coughs> Excuse me. We cover in-demand skills really thoroughly. Because I've been a working software developer for the whole time period that the school has been, uh, been around, I've got my finger on the pulse of what is actually in use out in the industry. And so we make sure our curriculum reflects what employers want, right? Our programs are endorsed by stellar online reviews. They're designed to fit around your personal schedule. And we want to prepare you for your technology career with a really well-rounded toolkit. In America, the average cost of boot camps is right now about $13,500. Ours are under that national average. And we even have boot camps that start as low as $5,300 for tuition. I want to read our mission statement because this is why we exist. The mission statement of the Tech Academy is to graduate entry-level technology professionals that excel in the basics of their field and thereafter have successful careers in the tech industry and whose actions raise industry standards and surpass client expectations. That's our mission. And our product is you working in tech. That's why we do everything we do. To that end, I want to tell you about a really cool new service. It's barely a month old. It's called the Tech Academy Accelerator. It's a monthly subscription program. It includes live weekly workshops with me, over 100 educational videos, and over 100 self-paced 
online mini classes. What's unique about these workshops we do is that we do a deep dive into complex technical subjects. For example, uh, the, the workshop we had last night, I started going through the whole process of what if you have an application you've built on your own machine, but you want to feature it so that other people can see your work, you know, a portfolio. It's one thing to just, you know, go to GitHub, which is where it's an online platform for storing your code and people can look and see, oh, that person made a computer program. Great. But what about deploying it live out on the web so that people can actually use it and see, oh, wow, they really know what they're doing. Well, we went through the, you know, it takes a while to get a full application deployed. So we got the first stages of it done last night, learned a lot in the process. It's a blast. We'll probably pick up with that next week. And so if you're interested in like deep dive things like that, where you see like it's not polished and edited and perfect. It's what really happens when you try to do technology. It's a blast, right? What's also unique about these meetings, these workshops is it's, um, there's always Q&A. In fact, it's not like wait till the end for Q&A. There's open voice and chat throughout the whole thing. So you can just stop me, ask questions. I'll pick them up right then. And so it's basically, you, you, you can consult with a senior technologist either while you're learning to get into tech or as a working technology professional, right? And we teach topics that are suggested by the community because there's a whole community around it, an online platform you can be part of. And the cool thing is it's only $9.99 a month. It's really inexpensive. We put it there just for people to experience what it's like to work with us and genuinely to accelerate your career. I take tremendous pleasure and joy in helping people accelerate their technology careers and do well. And so this is, this is the way I get to do that and help people in the process. All right, so class expectations. Here's like what this class is and isn't. What it is is simple definitions for technical terms. We'll cover technology-related concepts. We'll explain them in plain English. This particular class doesn't have any coding in it. Now, we do run regular, i.e. every single week, free coding classes. So you can register for our next actual coding class on Meetup. Regina, if you could drop a link to the next coding class into chat, if people are interested in that, right? And... I'm going to take a moment to have a sip of water while she drops that link in. There you can go. I recommend registering for that. I think this next one is this Friday. They're a lot of fun. If you ever wanted to learn like the fundamentals of how to program a computer, we cover it really, really well. All right. So let's stop right there and we will switch and we will answer the question hopefully to some degree of satisfaction of our coding boot camps, even worth it. I didn't put even, that sounds derogatory. Okay. All right. Now, before I even go on into the material, I want to cover something. Uh, I think I chose the wrong. No, I didn't. That's the right one. I started at the wrong place. There we go. Before we get started, I want, I want to cover something. It would be really easy for you to think that I have a bias here. I'm the founder of a coding bootcamp. But I want to give you a little bit of background. There are basically three routes to break into tech. We'll cover this in detail in a moment. But there's three basic routes to get into the technology industry. Go to college or university and get a, a degree that's related to the subject. Or go to a coding bootcamp or self-study. I happen to have all three in my background. While it wasn't college, the formal training I did in the Navy, if you add it up in terms of like semester hours, is equivalent to about three to three and a quarter years of straight technology education. They just compressed it into an incredibly packed year and a half that I will never forget. Because they're the Navy, they kind of own you. So if they say your study schedule is 70 to 90 hours a week, guess what? Your study schedule is 70 to 90 hours a week. And you'll say thank you for it. All joking aside, it was really, really, really good training. So I've got that experience of formal training, you know, from experts in a subject, right? I've also got the experience of self-taught. Um, in fact, I'm going to share a story that I've, I've, I don't think I've ever shared in one of these classes. So I've talked a bit about like being like, well, I think, 12 years old, right? And my dad walks in the door with uh, one of the first personal computers. It was called a VIC-20. And VIC-20s were the first like mass market success 
of home computers. They sold over a million units in less than a year, and they made all kinds of news. And it was, a, it was, it was a, it changed things in the culture, right? But about three months later, I really wanted to learn to program, and there weren't at that point any really good books to learn to teach you to program on that machine. It had just been launched, and there wasn't anything. And so I happened to be, I grew up in a real small town in Northern California, Fort Bragg, California, right? And we had a hardware store there that had a little radio shack sort of tucked away in part of the hardware you know, store. Back then, radio shack was a big deal, right? And radio shack was part owned by a company called Tandy. And they came out with a machine machine a computer that we all affectionately refer to now as the trash 80 it was the trs 80 and it was at the time like an 800 dollars personal computer this is 1982 it was a lot of money for this computer and they had one literally up on a pedestal in the middle of this radio shack and i was down there one day getting something i don't know what it was and i saw this thing and i looked at the person behind the counter and i looked at the computer and i looked at the person behind the counter and i said hey can I look at that computer? And I'm like, go for it. No one ever looks at that thing. Do whatever you want to with it. So I went over and in the pedestal underneath were all the training manuals for that machine, including a complete manual on a computer programming language you may have heard of called basic. And so for the next three, three and a half months, about four to five days a week, as soon as I was done with school, I would go down to the, to the radio shack and I would stand in front of that computer and I taught myself to code. It's rough, but I got through it. So I've got experience and all the way through the rest of my technology career, I've self-taught myself on a lot. So I've got experience with the self-taught part of it, right? And of course, I have a lot of experience with boot camps. So I was trying to give you this prelude to let you know, when I put the materials together for this thing, I was trying to be as objective as I could with what I want to present. So I, you form your own opinion. Do your own research, but I'm not just going to say automatically, well, yeah, of course, boot camps are the best because I happen to own one. That's BS. I'm not going to do that. There is value to each and every route into tech. There's a right fit for you. If you do want to break into technology, I want to give you the data. All right. So I want to cover first some of the different factors that you should consider if you want to break into technology. This doesn't, you know, no matter which route you take, what should you look at? Well, the first thing is you're going to want to have an understanding, at least some of the basics of computer science fundamentals. There is a discipline called computer science, and it is well taped. At this point, we're 70 or 80 years into the computer age. And there's some principles that are really, really valuable for you, especially as you advance in your career and you're solving greater and greater complexity of problems. We'll talk about that in a moment. But it's at least something you're going to want to think of. You're going to have to put some attention on if you want to break into technology. One of the things you really want to look at is you want to have a well-rounded set of skills. Now, I'm going to tell a little story to kind of illustrate why that's valuable. When we started the Tech Academy back in 2013-14, in um, there was another boot camp that started within a few weeks of us in Portland, Oregon. In fact, at one point, there were four different boot camps in Portland, Oregon. As of two months ago, there's one, it's us, but it's the vagaries of the business world. But you go back then, and there was a phenomenal school called um, Portland's Code School. Now, Portland Code School only taught one primary language, and it was a whole system called Ruby on Rails. It's basically a set of tools that can help you rapidly create uh, computer programs that are attached to a database and have a front end that can present on the web. So you think of you're working with the website, but on the back end, there's a bunch of you know, logic and program, and it's connected to a database. In other words, you can make some pretty versatile programs. Part of the reason this school chose that was because at that time, in the sort of microcosm that was the Portland, Oregon tech industry, there were a big number of employers that were super hungry for Ruby on Rails developers. And so there was sort of a pipeline that was pretty effective for this school for a couple of years of graduating people with you know good practical skills they did a good job in that skill set ruby on rails but being a working developer myself i saw the writing on the wall and about 
two and a half, three years into this, the market for Ruby on Rails developers just collapsed overnight. There's a lot of reasons for that. Technology changes pretty rapidly, right? And we don't have time to debrief why that exact thing occurred, but I've seen it happen over and over again. Brief spikes in popularity of a certain technology and then drops. And knowing some of those graduates, I know that they had a really hard time in the open market trying to get other positions because they were pigeonholed. So this is why I put this on here. A well-rounded set of basic tech skills is pretty important. Okay, we'll talk about what these mean in detail, but that's one of the things you're gonna to wanna to consider is getting yourself a well-rounded set of skills. Another factor you wanna look at is you wanna learn current and in-demand technologies. There's some outliers. Give another example. Over on the East Coast, there's a bunch of insurance and financial services companies. They've been around for between 100 and sometimes 250 years. There's big players in that insurance and finance area, right? And when the technology industry, computer industry, really came up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, there's a certain point where they hopped on board with big money and they needed a computer programming language that was centered around financial transactions and everything related to large data sets that were financial, right? Or probabilities like the insurance company. And so there was a language developed about 1957, 58 called COBOL, Common Business Oriented Language. And it was perfect for what they want to do. I want to point out that it's not 1957 anymore. It's been a huge number of decades, but there are still huge insurance and finance companies that have giant computers and the programs that were written over the decades in COBOL are still in use today. So that's an outlier. And it's such an outlier that most technologists know this and they kind of joke about it. They go, wow, if I really wanted to have a, you know, get paid a lot and hate my job, I would learn COBOL because all the COBOL engineers are dying off. Don't mean to be morbid, but it's true. All the COBOL engineers are dying off. And those insurance and finance companies are like, oh my God, we've made a horrible mistake. We've never updated our technology. Can someone please learn COBOL? But you're pigeonholed. So all that is to say that if you're thinking about going into tech, it is important to you know, understand what you know, is currently in demand and to make sure that you build yourself that way in terms of your skill set and choose things that have some legs. They have a pro high probability of being around for a while. <clears throat> Pardon me. Another important factor to consider if you're looking at breaking into tech is you need to learn how to work in a collaborative work environment. There's this myth that still persists to this day that a coder, a programmer, does most of his or her work all by themselves. The, the silly joke is that they're down in the basement, you know, drinking coffee or caffeinated cola all night and eating Cheetos and going on all night binges of coding all by themselves. The truth is completely different. Software development is a very collaborative activity, but there's a pattern to it that's really common. There's a way that teams collaborate together to work multiple contributors on one computer program. And you need to know something about that to be able to be an effective member of a team when you get on the job. So it's another thing to pay attention to. That goes beyond just knowing how to, how to program a computer. And that speaks to what is the day-to-day -day work like? And you should know that kind of stuff or pay attention to it. Another factor is clearly the cost. It's got to be a factor. I don't know many people who just have money lying around. I pay attention to what I spend. Another factor to consider is like the length of getting training, getting to the point where you will be acceptable as an entry-level member of a technology team. How long does that take? It's certainly something you should consider. And finally, again, quite apart from either knowing how to program, apart from knowing how to work as part of a collaborative team, you should know something about the technology of getting hired in tech. How does that work? There are a lot of things that are pretty common across every industry about how to get hired. Obviously, good manners and follow-up and you know, like the diligence involved and that kind of thing. But there's some peculiarities of getting hired in technology. More importantly, there's gaining an understanding of what people are actually looking for in an entry-level tech worker. What are the most important qualities that people are looking for? 
so you should pay attention to that because obviously if you're going to go through the spending the money or the time and trying to be well-rounded and learn current technology you need to go through all that effort you should put some attention on okay great how do i get the job so these are this is by no means an exhaustive list but i consider these like the you know seven pretty important things to look at if you're considering getting into the technology industry so i've already kind of spoken to this so i'll keep this relatively short but there really are really only pardon there's only three routes into technology that i know i know of you can get a college or university degree now there's some nuance there there's straight computer science degrees at a lot of institutions but there's also technology adjacent degrees you can get you know management information systems um you can get project management related degrees you can get data science related degrees right but they all have computer science you know at their core right so that's one route into technology and for decades that and being self-taught were the only routes in We've all seen this cultural change over the last several decades. The cachet of the degree, having that paper on the wall, is slowly declining. One note, by the way, that's pretty interesting. This is matter. The thing I'm going to tell you has no bearing on whether you should choose to be self-taught or go to a boot camp or go to a university. It's just a pretty interesting piece of data. If you look at job listings for technology roles, invariably, in the job listing, you will see that one of the requirements is to have a degree. I can tell you with complete and utter certainty that 99 point, well, never mind, actually 100% of the time, it's not true. They don't require a degree. There's a whole story about why they're even in there that I went into in a previous talk about a month ago, but it's not true. You don't need the degree. Just want to put that out there. Now, there's a lot of benefits of getting a degree. We're going to get into that in a minute. So, the other route in is boot camps. And again, these are really new. If you look at the technology industry, the idea of essentially a trade school to get into tech is a brand new idea. When, when I designed this thing and then brought on my co-founder, Jack, um, there were only probably less than 10 boot camps in the whole country. And in fact, the very first one, it made national news had only been opened nine months before in San Francisco, California. So this whole boot camp thing, I can understand still 10 years later, why there's certain aspects of it that aren't common knowledge or why they can be viewed with a little bit of trepidation because they are new, but they're extremely valid route to get into technology. About 50,000 people a year get into technology through boot camps. It's not like this is a minor thing. The number of people to get into boot camps through universities is about 50 or 60,000 a year. So they're both contributing in roughly equal numbers. The final route in is self-study, be a self-taught developer. That has been around, well, the entire you know, existence of the technology industry. That was actually, of course, the first route before there were formal, formal computer science degrees was self-taught or on-the-job training or however you could learn it, standing in front of a trash 80 at your local radio shack you took whatever whatever steps you needed to do to learn how to program and get yourself hired so those are the three routes and honestly i've never found any other route that is significant to get into technology formal degree boot camp or self-study all right now we're going to take up each one of those elements that we spoke of before and just kind of look at where do these three routes stack up so the first area we're going to look at is the computer science fundamentals area Now, you might ask, why does this matter? If, you know, I've, I've already spoken about the fact that you need current modern tools and people can be looking for, can you hit the, hit the ground running in the, in the new role? Well, that means you need to know the kind of things, that we, tools that we use. But here's the thing. J paying some attention to computer science fundamentals when you're trying to break into tech matters because of this. The type of problems you can solve and the scope of the problems you can solve as a technologist, are actually limited to a great degree by your knowledge of what's underneath that keyboard, by your knowledge of how digital computers and software work 
at a fundamental level. We don't have time to lay out the whole ecosystem of software development, but I will say there's a lot of really amazing modern tools you can use that make the whole process a lot easier than it was in past decades. But the fact is that each one of those tools you use works as well as it does because of what computer programs are down inside that machine. And you can make better use of those tools and you can work on more difficult problems, the ones you get paid a lot for, if you understand the fundamentals of computer science. So that's why it's important to pay attention to this. Okay, so that said, what I decided to do for this is basically just try to objectively look at on a, a five-star scale, right? One you know, out of five. How do these three different ways to get into tech stack up? For computer science fundamentals, I put college at a four out of five. And in fact, I've worked with a lot of the graduates of some of the top universities in the, in the country. And some of the programs out there are absolutely a five out of five. You learn computer science extremely well with some of these programs. So I would rank them really high, say four out of five. On a boot camp, it varies widely from program to program, but I, I just put it around a three out of five for how well they address computer science fundamentals. In the beginning of the industry, you know, 2012, 13, 14, there wasn't a lot of attention paid to this, honestly, by anyone but us at, at the Tech Academy. But we've seen this trend that boot camp designers and curriculum experts are, are recognizing you've got to put in some of the fundamentals at the beginning. You can't just start them out with coding and, and not teach them what happens under the hood. So I'd say around a three out of five for boot camps. In terms of self-study, this is a really difficult one. It's hard to gain this knowledge in self-study for a lot of reasons. I put it at a two out of five. One of the chief reasons why, and this is, this is still to this day personally very frustrating. If you go online and try to learn about computer science fundamentals, the most popular resources you're going to find, it's not a surprise, they're actually free resources from a lot of top universities, which on the surface of it sounds really, really awesome. But having deeply explored virtually every single one of them, I can tell you this, they are unbelievably hard to get through. Extremely hard to get through. One of the primary reasons is this, that's two. One, like the, a problem with a lot of technology education, they assume too much prior knowledge on the part of the student. They assume you've got some fundamentals of mathematics and statistics and higher math and data structures and a bunch of stuff. They assume you already know that and they dive right in and it goes over your head really, really easily. The second reason, probably the biggest one is they never define their terms. They'll throw out a word, which is an English word that's been pulled into technology and it has a very nuanced, precise definition in the technology industry that isn't the same as you would use that word in casual conversation in normal English. And they make no effort to define the word. It's almost like they expect you to figure it out by osmosis or by the context. I feel very passionately about this. I'm not going to back off of it. That's a horrible mistake to make as an educator. You have to define the terms of your subject in a clear, simple fashion. So that's why I put this self-study route of at least getting some fundamentals you know, in computer science under your belt, it's really difficult, so I put it at a two. So there we are. On computer science fundamentals, I put colleges at four, boot camps at three, self-study at two. All right, now let's talk about a well-rounded set of basic technology skills. So I'm going to give you a list. It's not exhaustive, but it is pretty accurate. There's no set standard to this, but here's some of the things you should know to be, quote-unquote, well-rounded. You should know how software is made. Like what's the actual process people go through to take something from the idea to designing what it's going to be like to actually coding it and then testing it and then deploying it out to the end user and then maintaining it over time. How does that process work? You should know something about that. That is separate from actually writing the code. In fact, only one part of that is writing the code but you should know about that. Even if you're not going to be a quote unquote web developer, you should absolutely know how the web works. About 70 to 85% of all computer programs that are made today use the technologies of the web 
in one way or another, even if not building a quote unquote website, computer programs and actual computers need a way to communicate with each other to get any meaningful work done. And most of the time, the technology they use to do that communication is the underlying technology of the web. So you better know how the web works. Just a moment. Another area you really want to know about is what we would call the holy trinity of the web. That's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Those three technologies, which I'll explain in a moment, are core to doing web development. And you should know a little bit or a lot about each. HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language, is the language we use to lay out what content is on a web page and what it's going to look like. CSS, which stands for Cascading Style Sheets, is a technology for making style decisions or rules about web pages be written once in one location and apply to multiple web pages all at once. And pretty helpful if you have large websites. And finally, JavaScript. JavaScript is a programming language which was originally designed for and is still used for making your websites dynamic. Rather than just being static image and pictures, it lets you actually have programs that run in your website to provide some sort of like dynamic experience for the user. And so those three things, again, they're casually referred to as the holy trinity of the web. You should know at least a bit about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, even if you're not going to be a web developer. Next thing you should have in terms of, again, this is all under the heading of a well-rounded set of basic technology skills. You should understand version control. Version control is the computer programs and human processes that are used to manage the different versions of text files that are your computer program. Without getting too nerdy and deep about it, when you write a computer program, you have one or more, usually a lot more, actual text files. And that's where your computer code is written, is, on, is, is in all these text files. Now those text files can't make a computer do anything. You have to take them and feed them into a specialized computer program that turns them into instructions that your computer can run. That's beyond the scope of this. But during that development process, maybe you have five, 10 people working on one big, large program, keeping track of who did what and when is really vital. So you should have a basic understanding of that in terms of being a well-rounded entry-level developer. You should also understand how to use a specialized tool called an integrated development environment. Now, this is really fun. An integrated development environment is just a computer program that helps you write computer programs. It usually has a text editor where you can write these files that I've been talking about. It's also got, you know, a folder and file directory so you can keep track of where you put all of your files. It's got special tools to take those text files that I'm talking about and do that thing I talked about, turn them into instructions the computer can actually execute. Because otherwise, you're just writing a bunch of text files and you can never run the program. So you need that. In other words, these IDEs or integrated development environments, they bundle together all in one place a lot of the common tools that you as an engineer or technologist need to use in doing your job. So you should know fundamentally how to use the basic you know, tools inside an IDE. You should also understand both what relational databases are and a little bit about how to actually use them. And by the way, the short version is a database is just a stored collection of electronic data. A relational database is speaking to how they organize that data. It's organized in sets of tables, you know, rows and columns, right? And you take data of a certain type and you make a table out of it. Maybe it's address data, maybe it's customer data, maybe it's order data, maybe it's product data, right? And you make a table for each. And these different things are related to each other. So you can define how an ad, you know, a customer is related to an address. Maybe you have five customers that live at the same address, as an example, right? So you should understand the, the basics of that and how to work with them because that's how most computer programs that are of any value to an organization, that's how they work. They store data in a database so you can use it later. Shouldn't be too, too, too surprising. Another element of this well-rounded set of basic technology, technology skills, and I hope you're not going getting overwhelmed, okay? There is a fair bit to know, and I'm laying out these are just the core things, right? Another thing to look at is you should know a general purpose programming language. Let me clarify. 
there's thousands of computer programming languages and they were created by their designers to be oriented around specific types of activities. Some of them are specifically and only for working with databases. Others like JavaScript, at least you know, in the early years, JavaScript was specifically and only about working inside websites. That's changed over the years and it's expanded. You can do a lot of cool things with it, right? But there's these you know, specific purpose languages. Well, there's also a whole category of what we call general purpose programming languages. And the languages are designed to help you as an engineer build all sorts of tools from websites to, you know, uh, computer programs that don't interact with, you know, human beings through an interface to, um, you know, database management systems, all kinds of stuff, right? You need a general purpose programming language that can help you build a big variety of computer program types. If you don't have that, then you have a language which has a tightly defined scope and you're less valuable as an entry-level worker. Another tool in this, and there's only four left, okay. Another tool that you wanna look at to have a well-rounded set of basic technology schools is the basic principles of what we call object-oriented programming. Now, we could talk for two or three hours on object-oriented programming, so I'll just be very brief here. There's two basic approaches to making a computer program. You can have what's essentially a script. Think of it as a recipe. You start with step one, and when you're done with that, you go to step two, and then you go to step three, and so on, right? That's called procedural programming. You're, here's a procedure. Hey, Mr. Computer, run this. There's a whole different style, which is called object-oriented programming. And in object-oriented programming, you're going to use your program to create. When the computer program is running, it creates inside the computer objects that represent real world things. You might have a student object if you have a program that relates to running a school. You might have an instructor object in that same program, right? You might have a course object, right? So you have the student, you have an instructor, you have a course. And once you've created these, now you can set up what, how they all will interact with each other. Well, you can take a class object and you can fill it full of students. You can assign an instructor to that. Right? You can connect a specific course to it. And these are all objects. Now, there's a lot more to object-oriented programming, but that's really what it is, is writing your programs so that they have within the program the kind of objects that that program is meant to work with. So you should have, because it's an incredibly popular approach to writing computer programs, you need to understand at least the fundamental principles. So when you get on the job, you aren't just caught flat-footed when you see a program designed that way. All right. Another thing that you, to be well-rounded, you should have is at least some understanding of and a little bit of experience in what we call full stack development. Now, here's what I mean. A stack in this specific um, you know, uh, situation refers to the three places that most computer programs need to have some, some uh, work done. There's the front end. Typically, that's a web page or multiple web pages, right? This is where the user gets to be presented with data and where they can interact with your program. Think of it as the user interface. So that's one. That's the top part of the stack, if you will. The second part of the stack, just down below that, which we call the back end, and is a second computer somewhere that has your computer program on it that receives whatever interaction the user made on the web page. And they're going to desire something to happen. Like maybe they want to see a list of all the students in the classes. Maybe they want to change which instructor is assigned to a class in this example that I'm making up right now, right? Well, the user said they want to do that and the front end captured the intent of the user. Well, that intent needs to be sent to a different computer where your program is. And your program needs to handle that. And so that's the back end. And then finally, we've already talked about it. That program is almost assuredly going to need a database to connect to because it's going to need to access historical data in order to be of any value to people. So those three things, front end, back end, or they call it server side programs, and then database, that is full stack. And so full stack development means you at least 
can operate on you know the common tasks in each of those three areas and you know how they all relate how they communicate with each other without having that you severely limit your ability to enter a development team on that first job and be useful if you only have a couple of those you have limited utility and so well-rounded means having at least some understanding of and a little bit of experience in full stack development almost to the end here Another aspect of having a well-rounded set of basic technology skills would be understanding project management basics. I've already mentioned that like creating software in the modern age is a pretty dynamic collaborative group activity. It can come, here's a stable thing for you. Making software takes a lot of time and it's expensive. One thing we're used to, by the way, as you know, technologists, every relative we have or casual friend, at least five, 10 times a year, we'll have someone come up and say, I've got this brilliant idea for an app and you should do this and you should do that. I had my brother, <laughs> my brother came up with one. <laughs> he said, okay, wouldn't it be cool if like when you're out playing pool, you got your smartphone and it's your, it's your turn, right? And you could hold the smartphone up, phone up and it would analyze where the balls are, especially the cue ball. And it would show you exactly the right angle to put your stick at an estimation of the force, wouldn't that help people play pool? <laughs> and first of all, I didn't think anybody would use it, but I wasn't gonna like jump all over, rain all over his parade. And he said, I mean, that would be pretty easy to develop, wouldn't it? <laughs> I just wanted to die inside because no, that would not be easy to develop, right? So here's the point is software is expensive. It takes a good number of people with talent to build it. It's a collaborative activity, but in an effort to reduce the time and reduce the expense, there are a tremendous amount of thought has been put into how do you manage these software projects? Because they have to be feasible. The company has to be able to like get them out to market and demonstrate enough value to the users that they'll pay them enough money that the company can be around. And so you need to know at least some of the fundamentals of project management in the modern software industry or you're not gonna be able to be part of that system there. And finally, last one, you should understand a little bit about developer workflow and collaborative development practices. Here's what I mean. What does the day-to-day -day life of a developer really look like? How do they you know, grab a task that they're meant to be working on? Actually like get set up on their own personal computer, when I say personal, on their, their work computer to do the work, get some work done and then contribute what they did into this collaborative activity, make sure that it gets some review and is approved, and then put it through the whole process of code, test, deploy, and maintain. How, how, what does that workflow look like, right? And how do you do that when there's multiple people? How do you collaborate, right? So there they are, I'll read them again. Well-rounded set of basic technology skills how software is made, how the web works, the holy trinity of the web, which is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, version control, how to use an integrated development environment, relational database fundamentals, a general purpose programming language, the principles of object-oriented programming, some aspects of full stack development, project management basics, and developer workflow and collaborative development processes or practices. Yes, it's a lot. If that didn't overwhelm you, I don't know what to say. It's a lot. I do want to point out that software developers make a lot of money. I know it isn't all about money. That's a whole separate thing, a whole separate discussion. But part of the reason we get paid well is just the base training and experience to be able to contribute to making software. There's a lot there. It takes time and effort, hard work, to get to the point where you are well-rounded, you know, basic set of technology skills and capable of being part of an engineering team. It takes some work. And because of that, and because we solve difficult problems that earn our companies a lot of money, we get paid well. So yes, if you're a little bit overwhelmed by that, totally got it. I do understand, but that's what it is. So all that said, let's look at where colleges, boot camps, and self-study rank. This one is just really painful but it's the truth. Colleges are at best a two out of five. 
at best. It's frustrating, but after all these years and working with a lot of professors and talking with them, I, I understand why it is. Here's a big thing. For a college or university to get a change made to its curriculum once it's been approved means a process lasting between 18 and 48 months on average. There's so much governance of this area, and I understand why. To have an approved curriculum takes a long time. And any change to that curriculum of significance require approvals from external bodies, and they do not move fast. In addition, it's really difficult. Some colleges have cracked this, and I, it's really cool when they do. It's really difficult for them to replicate the actual like developer workflow and collaborative development practices and like what it's like to actually be on the job making software. They're not set up that way. They're set to teach you how to code and teach you computer science fundamentals, but they don't have like a lab where you can work on real software. They have a bunch of assignments you'll do and it might be a project capstone kind of thing at the end, but that's about it. Now, I've seen some really cool things here because, again, not, this is I'm speaking generally, and I do not want to like try to paint a picture that it's all this way because it isn't. There's a couple of universities that I've worked with closely that um, partner clo um, really well with local industry, local technology companies, and set up a bit of like a almost an incubator or a really cool practical lab. And they give like an opportunity for certain students to work on real software. And it's stunning. It's awesome. But they're few and far between. And then here's, a, here's one that every time it happens, even after all these years, it blows my mind. I was teaching a class uh, to a bunch of what we would call early in career. That's the term, early in career technologists. What that really means is they just graduated from a you know CS degree or some technology related degree. And one of these big Fortune 500 companies um, brought me on to teach them like this, how do you get someone who just graduated from college to understand modern technology tools and practices and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> they didn't know how the web works. None of them, not as, there was 27 people in this class, not a single one of them could describe in simple terms how the web works. They use it all day, but they couldn't describe it. And I meant what I said earlier, the technologies underlying the web are involved in like at least 70 or 85% of all software development projects going on today. It was just glaring. I'm like, how, why, what? Now, again, I'm not going to bash all over them. There's some points we're going to cover where they excel, right? But it's true. Boot camps, if they're set up well, if they understand what well-rounded means, they generally do a really good job of this. I put them about four out of four out of five. And again, every boot camp is different. But it's certainly one of their strengths is trying to make a well-rounded entry-level technology worker. And finally, self-study. I put that at two out of five, but for a whole different reason. This list I just went through, I've never seen it listed out in clear, understandable form anywhere. So if you are trying to self-teach, you are met with a tremendous number of conflicting opinions about what language you should learn and what frameworks you should learn and which you know, uh, general purpose programming language you should choose and you know, which integrated development environment you should choose and which of the various technologies related to the web are the most important. There's so much opinion out there and you don't have a blueprint. And so what can happen for a self-studied uh, self person is they don't know what they don't know and there can end up being big gaps and so they don't end up being well-rounded and they only find out when they go in for the interview. Additionally, one of the hardest things to do is gain an understanding of what that developer workflow is like. What's it like to actually do the job? They've got no context, right? Now, there's a lot of benefits to self-study, again, but they look, they're low in this area. All right, let's move on. Learning current in-demand tools and languages. I already actually mentioned a couple of the factors in here. So... I'm going to like be pretty quick on this one. Um, first, it means not just in demand now, but technologies that have some degree of longevity. Look, technology changes rapidly, but not all sectors of it change at the same pace. And 
you want to pay attention to, am I choosing a set of technologies that at least for the next year, two, three, four, five, will probably be pretty popular if you're trying to break into technology because you don't want to learn something and then six months later on the job go, well, we're not using that anymore. Learn a bunch of new things, right? So how do these three routes stack up? College, I'm being charitable by saying two out of five. For example, there are a tremendous number of college programs around the country that are still teaching you to learn the fundamentals of programming using a language called C. C is being used to create approximately 0% of modern computer programs. Literally, no one uses C for anything beyond these tiny micro niche things, jobs that you'll never bump into. And we know why. It's really, really hard to get curriculum changes. There's some change in that. I do find some uh, universities out there teaching Python or are using Python to teach their fundamentals. And that's good. Python's awesome, right? But all the other things, current in-demand tools and languages, they can't keep up. They're literally prohibited by the way they work from keeping up. It frustrates them. One of the chief advisors to our school has been the head of the computer science department at a local university out in Oregon. And it's just a source of constant frustration to him that he can't get these changes into the curriculum as quickly as he'd like. So with, again, certain rare exceptions, if you're trying to learn current in-demand tools and technologies, colleges don't do so well, call it two out of five. Boot camps, that's why they were made, is this exact problem. So I'm going to give them a five out of five. Self-study, three out of five on average, right? Because all you got to do is do a you know, decent search on Google or on YouTube or whatever. And what's currently in demand, lots of people are talking about it. You can find out pretty quickly. And so, yeah, you can learn those in a self-study way. You can learn what's current and in demand. Now, again, you might miss some things because you don't know about those core elements that you're supposed to cover. But- you can learn them. All right. Now let's speak about knowing how to work in a collaborative environment. It's, it's so funny, man. Only about 10 to 15% of an engineer's day is spent writing code. Which can be shocking to people, but it's true. There's so much communication and collaboration and meetings and design and all this kind of stuff that has to happen. And so you need to know how to work in a collaborative environment. Colleges. They can be, they can, this can vary a little bit depending upon how forward thinking the pro program is, but generally they're around a two out of five. It's just, that's a real hard thing to manage is grabbing a bunch of college students with all these varied class times and everything and say, Hey, we're all going to collaborate on a project. Now you can get together two or three, four people and they can work on a capstone together. Right. So you can get some of that, but they're, it's, they're just not set up to show you the pattern of how to be. 10 people working on one very large computer software project and how you farm out the different jobs to different people and play to people's strengths and, you know, help people where they're in an area where they're weak by pairing them up with a more senior program. There's a lot of, a lot of things to do here, right? So you need to know how that colleges, they're not set up well for that. Boot camps about a four out of five. The good ones have some sort of a program that actually simulates a real world situation and you're working on hopefully real software and you're part of a larger team and you can get to collaborate on divvying up the work and getting someone else to review things and managing that whole process. Self-study, this is so hard. You're all alone. It's a one out of five for me, right? Because unless you happen to find two, three, four more people that are doing self-study, and you can get guidance from some sort of mentor who can say, oh, this is how all this works. And you can all build a project together and in a vacuum without working with a technology and experienced technology expert, try to figure out how that collaborative process works. It's really rough on this particular one. So I give that a one out of five. All right. Cost of education. This won't be a surprise to people. College is a one out of five. It's flat out expensive. Yes, you can do community college, and there's some really good ones, right? I come from, a, from Oregon. Or I lived in Oregon for 30 years. Portland Community College up there has now and has had for 25 years a phenomenal computer science program. It's really, really good, right? But even at community college, it can cost some money. Most computer science degrees, you're out $120,000 to $250,000 over a period of four years. Okay, and that's fine. They're teaching a lot more than that. You're getting well-rounded education. You're going deep in computer science. There's other benefits, but it costs a lot. 
Boot camps, I put them in a three out of five. We already, I already said that the average cost of boot camps you know, around the nation is $13,500. That's not chunk change, guys. That's the, people don't just have that lying around. It's not zero, I'll tell you that, which brings us to self-study. I put that at a five out of five. Now, there's certain inexpensive resources, but frankly, if you had that blueprint, right, and if you were just applying yourself industriously, you could get most of those things handled pretty well for like $100, $200 tops. Most of the resources are free. So I put that at a five out of five for cost of the education. Now let's look at the length of the education. And again, college takes a beating here. It takes four years. You can try to you know, chunk it up faster, but you're probably going to shave a year off. You're looking at three years. There's a reason why. You're doing a much deeper dive. Your computer science education is ex exceptional, right? But it takes a long time. It's just, it's the way, it's, it's the way, it's what you wrote. I, oh, sorry, that's, that's just the way the cookie crumbles, right? Boot camps, length of education, five out of five. This is, again, one of the primary problems they were designed to solve. Three to six months to gain a well-rounded entry-level skill set and break into tech and get $60,000 a year on average, like that's fast. And then there's self-study. This is totally dependent upon you and your ability to, you know, get access to or design a pretty sane, you know, program of study. But if you do well at it, you can do this in six, eight months, a year. So I put about a three on there for length of education, three out of five. And finally, you should know the technology of getting hired. On the college arena, this is about a two out of five. I've talked to a lot of college graduates and beyond just, hey, go do an internship. There's very little guidance on what the interview process is like. And, and this part is critical. There's very little teaching on what a hiring manager in technology is actually looking for in an entry-level developer. And there's a lot that can be said about this. We have specialists at the school. This is all they do. And they know this area really, really well. But I can tell you, for example, um, being the best coder to apply doesn't actually take you that far. There are other qualities that are much more important, including willingness to be wrong, to acknowledge that there's something that you that didn't work out the way you thought you it would, and learn from that process. Friendliness, collaborative, you know, approach to work with people, being deeply curious, like, yeah, the coding. Yes, you should be good at coding. But these other things matter a lot. <clears throat> Very rarely is that sort of covered in college. I give them out of two out of five. Boot camps, four out of five on this. Now, some boot camps recognize this from the beginning. Others had to learn the painful lesson because their graduates weren't getting hired at good enough rates. But you've got to put some attention on helping these people understand both the skills needed to get hired in tech and then ongoing consulting to help them through that process. Because even though there's a lot of jobs in technology, it's, it's hard work to get that first position. And then on self-study, back down to two out of five. I mean, that's rough knowing that technology of getting hired. There's some decent resources available on, on YouTube. But for example, it's really hard to drill what an actual interview is like. A phone interview, that technical interview with someone else at the company, right? The the whiteboard interview, the panel interview, whatever you like, you need to drill that. You need to go through that and experience that pressure and just, just flop and not do well and pick yourself back up and figure out where you went wrong. And like, that's what it takes to get good at that. Self-study really doesn't have a system for that, like a boot camp can. All right. So let's look at, look at the scorecard. I went through and I just added up the numbers on this. And college or university came out at 14, boot camps at 28. Self-study at 18. Now, that's not the whole story. Here's like the big picture, okay? Everyone has their own situation. If you want to go in tech, there's a lot of reasons to do so, right? Everyone's got their own situation. Totally understand that. So here's how I would summarize it. The college or university degree is really best for those with a good amount of time and money, enough that they can afford to lay in that solid foundation but they're going to need to solve some things once they, get, once they get in the job market. They're going to need to get current skills. I can tell you from working with a lot of hiring managers at very large companies to very small companies, most 
college grads are really hard to get up and running once they hit that first job. Now, it's worth it in the long run because they have that deep computer science background, which means that once they do learn those current skills, then they can be used to attack really gnarly problems. A lot of modern tech companies work with problems that involve huge scale, giant amounts of data, right? Or very rapid processes that need to occur. And those computer science things that people learned in their university degree can be brought to bear on solving problems of magnitude. It's pretty cool. But the runway is pretty rough when you hit your first job. So pros and cons. The boot camp route is best for people with little time and a moderate amount of money, but they're going to need to study CS, computer science, once they land the job. Like, you're still going to be burning the midnight oil if you're smart and boning up on, okay, what are all those things that my counterpart, you know, at the you know desk next to me, who's got a degree, they learned all about this stuff. I'm not going to throw out a bunch of terms right now where I put you to sleep, but you'll, you'll hear your friend talking about them in the office. And you're like, he or she keeps saying these things. I don't know what, I better fill those gaps in. Super important. If you want to move through the ranks to be a mid-level engineer or senior engineer and start working on some of those difficult, gnarly problems, you have some stuff to learn, but you got into the industry in six months and are making a good living while you're learning computer science. So again, pros and cons. Self-study. This is best for people to have a lot of time and very little money. There's two things they need to pay attention to. You're going to need to have some sort of approach to figure out where your gaps are. Because you, you, it, it's, there's such a risk to miss a critical aspect well beyond the coding, like learning a program language. As, as you probably come to recognize as I've talked tonight, there's a lot of other things. And if you miss one of those and are really weak in that, it's really hard to get your foot in your door. But it can be fixed, right? But you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to like pull yourself up by your bootstraps and solve that. And you gotta figure out how do I get practical experience in a collaborative development? It's not enough just to make a singular project or projects just by yourself. Yes, you'll learn a lot. And yes, they can be featured as part of an online portfolio. That is critical, but it's that collaborative process it's really hard to pull together. I've seen people do it. It's really cool. They'll, you know, social media is awesome. Pull together three or four people and say, hey, why don't we all build something together? You know, and that can work. So that's the big picture. So first of all, any questions? I went through there. It's a lot of data. I want to open it up to a QA. and a If you found that at all helpful, please drop a one in the chat to let me know, was there anything there that helped you kind of sort out where your head is at on some of this stuff? All right, good. Excellent, I'm glad. It's just, look, any route you take is good. If you're a bright, inquisitive person, who likes working with others and really wants to solve uh, you know, fun, challenging problems and wants to have good work-life balance, get into tech. I don't care how you do it. Technology needs you and it needs a wide variety of voices and backgrounds and skill sets. So just get into tech, all right? Obviously, I love our route. Why wouldn't I? All right. probably have the slide up that says Q&A, if you're going to do Q&A, right? So if there's, any, if there's anything else, that's fine. Let me pull the chat back up. I lost it. But feel free to drop a question in the chat. I'm watching it. And stick around because we've got a free gift coming your way, right? Also, in a minute, we're going to give you an email you can use to get your free gift. If you have additional questions, put them in the email. They always get forwarded to me. I answer them. I love answering these questions. So I want to hear about anything you guys you know want to know about. It'll help. All right, so let's talk a bit about the school and who and what we are. Obviously, I just told you a bit about boot camps. We're aware of each of those different factors that you should consider, and we've done our best to try to be excellent in each of those areas. We're not the right fit for everybody, but here's who and what we are, right? We offer 12 online boot camps, and they cover a wide range of technology subjects, including artificial intelligence, computer programming, 
website development, cybersecurity, design, data science, video game development, mobile app development. We cover a lot of areas. In fact, we have more certification programs than any other coding bootcamp on earth. A lot of routes into tech. People have a lot of different interests, okay? These boot camps are self-paced, but they're also instructor supported, which is pretty cool. They're flexible. Students set their own study schedule and students can enroll anytime, 365 days a year. The content that's covered, it's well-rounded and it's in-depth. It's not a shallow kind of look at anything. Also, the boot camps are affordable. As I mentioned, they're priced under the national average. And this part is key. We knew early on we had to teach this. Every program includes both job placement training, actual training you'll do about getting hired, and job placement assistance, personal guidance through that whole process, because it can be intimidating. I got it. And we help through that. Most importantly, these programs are designed for absolute beginners. You don't have to have any prior technology knowledge or coding experience. You don't have to be a nerd to get through these things. If you're a decent, nice person and you can read, write, and do basic math, you can get through these programs. We consistently land on every major best coding bootcamp list. That are, they're, they're put out by a lot of these entities, these groups throughout the, you know, every year. And we're always on that list, which we're very proud of. If you look at all the major bootcamp review websites, both dedicated to bootcamps and then, you know, the big guys like Facebook and Google, um, our average review, review rating is 4.8 out of five stars. And those reviews are from student and graduate feedback. So I've already mentioned a few things here, but I just want to, you know, give a little clarity. Why, why even consider working in technology? Well, one thing is it has really good work-life balance. You very rarely work more than just, you know, your, your 40 hour kind of job. Remote work is possible, right? And it is a really creative industry. I've already talked about it being a collaborative thing. There's a lot of personal pride you can take in your work when you're solving difficult problems that help people and you're doing it with people that are bright and inquisitive. It, it, it's personally satisfying. And finally, it is a stable industry. There's a whole talk I did a little while ago about like, is AI going to like kill the job of software developers? It's just chicken little. It's the sky is falling. It's not true. This is a stable industry and has been for decades and will continue to be. Yeah, there might be momentary ups and downs. But if you're a talented technologist and you can think really well with, you know, with technology concepts and you're a nice person, works well with others, you're always going to have a job. And those jobs pay well. And if you continue learning, I stress that continuous learning is part of this, right? You'll continue to get regular increases in pay. And the pay can be really good. The average wage for a software developer, by the way, in America is 120000 a year. And considering, by the way, that our graduates, on average, they get about $60,000 a year in their first job. If the average for all software you know, developers is one hundred and twenty, that tells you that ceiling is pretty high. It's just one thing to consider. It's not all about money, but it is a factor. So we've talked a lot about college, boot camps, self-taught. I want to talk about some of the barriers to entry to doing a boot camp because they are there. It does take money. Tuition boot camp costs thousands of dollars. Not going to lie. Now, we've done what we can to help with that. We have multiple financing options, including a big upfront discount if you just pay the whole thing in full. We have monthly payment options for people with bad credit, no credit. In fact, there's a tuition option for everyone and whatever your financial condition. But here's Here's how I feel about it. And at this point, I'm just going to say this opinion is biased. Having graduated, you know, at this point, over a thousand people working in tech, I really feel like getting a tech academy boot camp under your belt is an investment in yourself. Because I see how long, at this point, it's been a decade. I'm friends with a lot of our early graduates and I see what their careers have been like. It is an investment in you and your certainty and confidence in yourself and your ability to navigate a technology career. And it's just worth it. It's awesome. All right, now time. It takes some time to learn all that. I just spent nearly an hour laying out those core fundamentals and all the aspects of what you would want to have under your belt. That's going to take some time to learn, right? Some boot camps approach that problem by arranging the training into cohorts where they'll group together a bunch of people who want to go through the training and they all start on the same day. They do it you know, full-time, 40, 50 hours a week. That's all you're doing, right? Um, and everybody moves in lockstep through the curriculum. 
Don't like it at all. I don't learn that way. I learn faster on some subjects and slower on others. So our programs are fully online. So you don't have to be, go there in person. You choose your study schedule. They're self-paced. And we even allow part-time study schedules. So you can study your, you know, concurrently to holding a job or going to school. And finally, if you're going to get through a boot camp, you do have to have some technical interest and some technical ability. As I've already mentioned, part of the reason this can be a very daunting thing for people considering a boot camp or even a university or self-taught is that some of the technology education materials that you may have encountered are too hard. I've talked about that, that educators assume too much prior knowledge, and there's a lot of other factors. We've tried to solve that. At, at the Tech Academy, you don't have to be a nerd to get through the programs. You don't have to have any tech background to enroll. So all that said, I, I've got a question for you. Are, like, are you right now working a dead-end job? And I don't mean that like in a, in a super critical way. Like, I've got a dead-end job. I just mean this. If you project forward three, four, five, ten 10 years, what does that career progression look like? And what does that income ceiling look like? And what does that work-life balance look like? Dead end means whatever it means to you. But if you're in that, that's something to look at. Maybe you're even unemployed. Is it important to you maybe to have the possibility of working from home? Do you want more time with your loved ones? Whether or not you go into tech, if those things are true for you to any degree, is, is it maybe time for a career change? If it is, we're the solution. We are career change experts. We have this symbol of a bridge in our logo for a reason. It is the bridge that is your route into technology for everyone. We've tried to make this subject as approachable and understandable for anyone as possible. And we have a decade of experience in breaking people into technology at this point. As I said earlier, most Tech Academy grads make $30 an hour in their first job. That's $60,000 a year. And we have over 1,000 graduates working in tech. And everywhere, not just big giant tech companies, although they're there. We have people at Nike and Facebook and Disney and Uber and Epic Games and a bunch of others, right? Um, but we also have people at a lot of small businesses. Any decent sized business needs technologists. So as a reminder, we have open enrollment. You can start anytime. And I encourage you to enroll now. This is how to do that. Um, Jan, the job placement assist, uh, assistant uh, she says is available worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. We've helped people in other countries get hired. I mean, the, the approach is the same. And with the power of the web, <laughs> we have access to all the same kind of things you're going to need to use and look at for job opportunities and the coaching, all of that. It's available worldwide. And what if there's not a lot of tech companies in my uh, country? Also a great question, Jan. That's where the fact that a lot of tech companies are fully embracing remote work is awesome. If you're not near a bunch of tech companies, Unlike about five, six years ago, with the age of COVID, most companies have figured out how to do remote work. And if they haven't, they're really hurting because technologists are coming to expect it. And if you're a, everybody needs to be in the office kind of company, a lot of technologists would be like, peace out, see ya. So the short answer is, yeah, that can be handled. So there's that link, right? Regina just dropped it into chat. If you click on that link, you'll be taken to a very simple sign-in page. When you fill it out, there's a few steps to do afterwards. Don't do them right now, okay? But there's steps that'll tell you all about the Tech Academy. There's videos in there, some articles. There's even an optional step to book a call with our admissions personnel just to be able to make an informed decision. So if you want to do those steps, just do them after the event. Now, if this is of interest to you, fill out the form right now. I'm going to take a sip of water real quick because I've been talking a lot. By the way, if you happen to click on that link and it takes you to a login page instead of filling out a form, that just means you already have an account with us and you can see at the bottom of the screen how to figure out your username and password to log in. Just, uh, your free gift is coming in a moment, by the way. Just stick around. All right, a quick note here. Since our graduates really love us, referrals have been one of the top enrollment sources for us for years. Because of that, years ago, we instituted a 5% commission payment for people that refer people that sign up. If someone that you refer to enrolls, we give you 5% of whatever they paid for their enrollment. So in a moment, when you email in for your upcoming free gift, because it can be sent to your house, you can also include the name and contact data for any referrals that you'd like to. We keep track of that, and we, we pay those commissions. We love paying them. All right, quick thing. 
I just want to talk about our books for a second. We have seven publications, including three Learn Coding Basics and Hours books. We have a coding book for kids and young adults. We have a technology basics dictionary with clear, simple, easy to understand definitions for all these weird terms. We have a project management handbook. I spoke about project management a fair bit today, right? This breaks that whole subject down really well. And finally, we have You Are Not Stupid. The full name is You Are Not Stupid, Computers and Technology Simplified. And this thing is awesome. It's basically a written version of the first course on all of our boot camps. The first course is called the Computer Basics course. It removes all mystery from computers and technology in virtually every area you could think of. And this book goes in beyond all the modern technology terms and concepts are defined. It even includes a history of technology that show how we even arrived where we are today. With this information under your belt, you'll be a phenomenal technologist. And if you give it to your friends who constantly bother you for tech support questions, they won't bother you anymore. All right, so I mentioned the free gift. It is the project management handbook. I'm actually really happy this is the free gift tonight because this data is some of the hardest to glean if you are, for example, trying to self-study. It's really hard to find out, like, what does it look like to actually make software, right? If you don't already know all the terms and what to look up, which you learn in this book, it's hard to find it out. It's almost like chicken before the egg. So this free gift is an actual book that we will send to your actual house. Unfortunately, it's only in the U.S. So if you're in America and you want to copy this book, just email us with your full name and mailing address, and we will send you a copy of this book free of charge. Regina, if you could drop the um, email address for them to use in there so they can copy and paste it really easy, just use books at learncodingware.com. Include, again, your name, your full mailing, mailing address. Mailing address, we can speak English, and we'll send it out to you. Also, again, if you have questions you want to forward to me, do so. Put them in there. And if you have people you'd like to refer, put their name and contact data in there. I'll give a minute to have a sip of water, and anybody who wants to grab that email address to send it in can. Okay, so I mentioned links like to these videos, right? We do put these, push these, put these videos, we post these videos out to YouTube. And you can get that and all of our other links right here at our Linktree location. Linktree is a pretty cool site where you can list all of your socials and other links. So if you go there now, Regina just dropped into, into chat, right? You'll see a lot of links, including links to our free YouTube video playlist with a lot of our educational videos. You'll see links to our books and our dictionary. And you'll see links to our upcoming meetups, our free classes, which is pretty handy. Also, this is our social media account. So please follow us on social media and invite your friends to these future meetups and classes. Now, if you'd like to win a copy of You Are Not Stupid, we want to give these away. It's a really good book. No kidding, right? Here's how you do that. If you'll share a link on your social media to the next class, you know, get the, grab it from that link tree. You'll share a link to that next class. And if you got anything out of our classes, maybe say something nice or whatever. But if you share the link and tag us in the post, of course, we're going to be notified because we get tagged and we'll put your name in. And once a week, we choose a name out of the hat and we send them their own free copy of You Are Not Stupid. It's like 300 pages. It's a chunky book. It covers a lot of stuff. So thank you for attending. I hope this was helpful. No matter what route you take, I want to see you in technology and I want you to have a long and fruitful career. As a reminder, um, if you filled out the form to find out more about the school, do those steps afterwards. And I'd love to see you at the next event. Um, Jan, thank you. Oh, you saw the video about artificial intelligence replacing jobs. I'm glad. Yeah, that was near and dear to my heart. <laughs> it's not going to take away any jobs, but man, you should learn how to use it. It's really cool. I'm glad you like that, Jan. Thank you.